Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by the virtualinstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with the virtualinstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast on all of YouTube. Uh, what we do here on Getting Sketchy is either myself or my good friend and fellow artist, Ashley, we try to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. And we do these things in seasons, and this is actually season 11, and this is the Ninth. Ninth episode in season 11, and this will be my final drawing slash artwork that we're going to be creating uh, this season. Ashley will be doing the final drawing of the season, and That's then right. the week after that, we will have uh, an episode where we go back and look at all the drawings we've created for this season. Each one of us have created five drawings. Well, at that point, we will have. Um, but of course, like always, I'm joined by my good friend Ashley, who's sitting right over there. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for asking. I hope you folks are doing well also. We've got a great night planned. I can't wait to see what Matt does with his artists tonight. So I think you're in for a treat. Yeah, it depends on how you define treat. Um, because it might be a treat. I'm going to do two artists tonight. It is, it is October, so it's a it, trick or treat. Right, right. It's a trick or treat. Um, tonight, <laughs> uh, we're going to be kind of challenging uh, your perception of art and reality. Ooh. Ooh. Uh, so this should be a pretty fun. Uh, but I will remind you, uh, since you're watching this on YouTube, uh, if you like this kind of stuff, make sure you subscribe, subscribe to the channel and uh, hit the like button. Of course, that'll help other people find this video. And, um, you know, if you want to take your drawing and painting skills to another level, there's the membership program over at the virtualinstructor.com. Uh, highly rated by lots and lots of folks. Uh, it includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media. Just about any media or subject matter you can imagine is covered there. There's also weekly live lessons. So after we get finished here on Getting Sketchy on YouTube, we'll head over and Ashley is leading us through a series of live lessons right now on distortion with pen and ink and markers. Mm -hmm. um, and you have access to the vault of all the live lessons ever produced they go all the way back to uh, 2013, 2012, somewhere in there. So there's a ton of those. Uh, there's also weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute. And there's also a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers that includes pretty much everything you need to teach, except for your warm body, of course. So all the resources you need, videos, handouts, uh, even quizzes are included. All of that is part of the membership program. If you want to learn more about the membership program or if you want to start a trial, a free trial today, there's a link in the description below. You can check it out, of course. If you want to just check out three of the course videos and eBooks for free, uh, just to get a very small sample size of what is offered, there is a link in the description below for that as well. And that will also put you on our mailing list. So uh, whenever I send out a newsletter or free videos or updates and that kind of stuff, uh, you'll get them, of course. Uh, so I will also remind you that we do have a chat box, which yes. Ashley's gonna be running tonight. Uh, the chat box gets a little quick and heated here on YouTube, and I'm glad all of you are joining us from all over the world. Uh, if you do want your comment or question, uh, or if you do have a comment or question that's directed at us and you want it addressed on the air, we suggest that you use the super chat function that will highlight your your uh, question or your comment and make it pr uh, predominant. Is that the right word? I think so. Make it more pronounced. I accept um, that. And it'll also help the channel because it does uh, cost a little bit of money to do so. And uh, that will show your support for us. Of course, uh, there is a lot of money invested in equipment and it does just cost a little bit to uh, produ produce this production, uh, even though it's free for you here on YouTube. So uh, any any way you can help us there, that will be great. Of course, um, I think, have I said everything? I think so. Let's see, the membership course, um, <laughs> uh, what we're doing after this show and Super Chat. I, th right, I think right. that's it. All right. I think we're ready to take a look at what Matt's going to be drawing tonight. All right, so I'm going to be doing two artists tonight instead of one, um, and you'll see why at the end. We're actually going to be doing two artists that, that were, uh, both of them were heavily influential in modern art. Mm -hmm. um, the first artist that uh, we're actually going to be drawing with, well, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't give away too much what's <laughs> going to happen there. Uh, but the first artist we're going to be covering tonight is Rene Magritte. And Magritte is a surrealist, much like Dali was. Mm -hmm. Ashley did Dali a few weeks ago. Yeah, two surrealists. And um, we're going to have Magritte as well. So let's take a look at a few of his artworks real quick. Um, oh, 
And we well, have a super chat. Jan, Jan thank you so much for that. Chat. He says, uh, <laughs> thank you for the greatest live show on all of YouTube. We really appreciate that. And I, I don't have the button to do the cheer right now because uh, we're looking at artwork. Oh, but no. uh, Jan, we'll, we'll do we, the cheer for Jan in just a minute. Yeah, remind me of that, one. Ashley, there. Um, so thank you so much, Jan. I, we see you all the time in the chat. Uh, we really appreciate your support. Um, here is a piece by Magritte. And... Um, this is a wonderful look into uh, what you can expect with Magritte. Magritte was a Belgium artist, an artist from um, Belgium, um, and uh, he was a surrealist as well, and as as well as Dali. And he also, he was interested in challenging our perception of reality. Uh, so you know he's interested in the language, especially visual language, mm -hmm. and uh, he really didn't consider himself to be an artist, uh, which is interesting because our second artist tonight also didn't consider himself to be an artist. You know, uh, which interestingly, is, Dali, um, when asked what his occupation was, he yeah. he didn't say artist or painter. He always said genius. Yeah. Uh, well, there so, you go. So I guess it uh, runs in the movement. I, I th I'm going to start using that. So what do you do for a living? Oh, I'm a genius. I'm a genius, and sometimes I paint. Genius stuff. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, some of uh, Magritte had several themes that ran through his artworks. Uh, some of them were apples, uh, and uh, some of them were, of course, uh, this gentleman here. Um, and uh, we can see an image here that is very dreamlike. Mm -hmm. Very surreal. Again, you've got that really deep space in there that mm -hmm. we see with many of the other surrealists that represent the hidden subconscious. And here is uh, one of the most interesting pieces in art history, uh, if you ask me. And uh, this is a painting of a pipe. And underneath it, it is written in French, this is not a pipe. And uh, this is this really sums up uh, Magritte's approach to art uh, in one piece. Um, so I'll give you a second. What in the world does this painting mean? Uh, you know, this is not a pipe, but we can clearly see that we're looking at a pipe. Mm -hmm. What's the deal with that? I'll give you a minute to think about it. Yeah, the modern artists really ran with this. Yes, this was an influential painting. This mm -hmm. made a big difference in modern art. Uh, and, um, you know, some people can kind of, uh, even say that this piece ha heavily influenced the abstract art movement, which mm -hmm. followed shortly after, um, I, I've given you a minute to think about it. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> what did, what did Magritte mean with this art? What, what was he trying to, uh, communicate? And I think Jan has got it. He says here, this is not an apple. It is an emoji of an apple. There you go. And that's exactly what he was saying. It's representative of a pipe, as Orion Nebula has pointed out. Yet this is not a pipe. You it's can't a, put any tobacco in it's there. A, it's a painting. It's a painting yeah. of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. So, of course, the abstract uh, artists that followed uh, grabbed hold of this, and they started creating paintings for the painting's sake. And they were creating uh, visual pieces of art, not necessarily representational pieces of of reality right they weren't supposed to look like anything but what you see right in front of your face right uh so this is a heavily influential piece and uh, we'll come back to that in just a minute all right and here's another one of magritte's paintings mm -hmm. uh, as you can see here uh we've got the same gentleman that was in the image prior uh you know we assume he is but this time we have an apple in front of his face obscuring his view. Probably the number one, you know, the number one rule in portraiture is don't hide the face, right? So right. that was the, the, the rule he was directly, um, directly breaking, I guess. Um, and like I said before, a, a apple or apples was kind of a running theme in Magritte's art as well as this gentleman. And here's another piece with our friend. Um, and you can see that there is a cutout of this figure in the curtain. He did a lot of that with a, a negative shapes that mm -hmm. showed another thing. You know, in this case, yep. we're seeing the background through the negative shape, but sometimes he would just have the negative shape of a bird or a bouquet of flowers in the sky, and the weather would be different inside of the shape than outside of the shape. Really cool. All right, so we are ready here, and uh, we're going to be creating a piece in the style of Magritte. Are you gonna put a little boiler hat on top of this apple? In? I'm not, okay. no. Okay. Um, we are actually <laughs> going to uh, render this apple uh, over here. Um, and we are gonna use a combination of markers and colored pencils. I got a Posca marker out to a little bit of graphite and uh, uh, an ink pen. Um, and we are gonna create an apple 
but we are not creating an apple. We are going to create a drawing of an apple. Ah, uh, yes. So once we've got our drawing of an apple in place, we will write an appropriate message underneath it. Make sure that everyone knows that it is not an apple. Of course. <laughs> All right. Now, um, the photo reference that I'm working from is available under the community tab on the YouTube channel to get to this photo reference. Uh, all you have to do is go to the YouTube channel. You can access that by clicking on the little icon of my face in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. And then click on the community tab. There you will find uh, this image available to you for download if you want to follow along. I, of course, will have it up during uh, tonight's broadcast. Uh, the materials that I'm going to be using here, I'm going to be using Prismacolor Premier Colored Pencils and Prismacolor Premier markers. And I've got a few colors isolated. Um, and like I said, I got a Posca marker that I will use at the end. Um, I also have an ink pen. This is 0.2 millimeters. I think that's what that number means. And then I have an HB graphite pencil here. And uh, before anybody comments on my dirty hands, I, I've scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed, <laughs> but I've been working on one of my cars and, um, that's why my hands are dirty. So uh, we'll pretend it's graphite or charcoal, and then that will look real artsy. But uh, anyway, that's that's why my hands are nasty. Um, it's amazing what people pick up on and comment on. So bef I'm beating you to the punch there. Before you can comment on my <laughs> lovely model s hands, uh, that's that's it's why not they're dirt. It's grease, and that's <laughs> different. Well, I tell you what, it doesn't come out with the regular soap. You know, you know sure. that orange, that <laughs> orange soap that has the grit in it, right? The, uh, Gojo, Jojo, or yeah, something. Gojo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have stuff. any of that. So, uh, anyway, all right. So uh, my plan of attack here is I'm going to start with a light uh, sketch with the graphite pencil, and uh, then we'll go into the markers and uh, see how quickly we can render this apple in a representational way. Of course, all right. Uh, the, the point here is to be representational. After which, um, we will talk about the second artist, uh, which I will not reveal until the very end, if I can f find the button I'm looking for here. Um, if you'll be patient with me just to, for just a minute, I will bring up the uh for the I'll, I'll bring up the timer just be patient everybody <laughs> um i gotta get some stuff in place and we can't forget that jan gave us a super chat That's so right. thank you jan we really yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right now we're ready to go so i'm gonna go ahead and start the timer i'll have 45 minutes to complete this drawing so I'm going to start in the upper part of my picture plane here, um, and I'm going to kind of try to use the edges of my reference to figure out where the apple is going to be. I'm going to leave a little bit of space underneath this apple. If you're halfway sharp, you probably are going to figure out what that space is for underneath. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I have chosen an apple is because that was a running theme in Magritte's art one of his and, motifs yep and you'll notice that magritte did render things in a fairly representational uh manner i forgot to mention the the paper that i'm working on this is stonehenge paper and this is the fawn color so it's kind of a kind of a khaki it's kind of a khaki color and um that was similar to the color that we see in the background of the, the the painting, The Treachery of Images. That's the one that says, this is not a pipe. So again, some similarity there. Just gonna reform the shape of this apple a little bit so it's a little, a little less like a big old circle. And I like to use multiple lines when I'm sketching things out initially gives you some choices you know yeah pick up gives you some choices and it helps me to you know not be so stiff with my initial drawing now of course this doesn't have to be exactly like the apple that we have in the reference we just want to create a, a fairly representational apple all right so we've got this little area where the stem comes out here so we'll create a little recess and then we'll just go ahead and draw the shape of the stem here. 
I'm gonna let mine come a little bit off the top, a little bit more so than the uh, reference. I like that, just a little stronger overlapping. Yeah. And for our Apple, it does look like the light source is originating kind of over the shoulder of the viewer. So kind of coming over the right shoulder of the viewer, this is creating a cast shadow behind mm -hmm. the Apple. And we're only going to have a shadow behind. Uh, it does look like there's a little bit of a reflection on the surface that it's on, but I'm not going to going to put that reflection down there no, that will be in the way that would take away from you're right. That would take away from this image, especially since I'm kind of working on uh, that that's a different tone than white. All right, let's start with our markers. Uh, let's see. I've got a few greens isolated here. I'm going to start with a pretty uh, light. Well, look at this. I'm going to start with apple green. <laughs> How about that? That's perfect. <laughs> yep. And we're going to be using this basically as just a base to put uh, colored pencil applications on top. Well, once you color it in with apple green, you'll be done. You just picked it. Right. The right uh, absolutely. That's all it needs. Uh, now, this paper is 100% cotton, so it's it's not the most awesomest for working with markers, but it, it does accept the application. But you can see that it does create a little bit of that uh, that look like we used markers. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> a little, little uh, so subtle value. Uh, irregularities right uh, but I am going to try to make my strokes flow. You know, there's, there's subtle value irregularities all over the apple so make yeah that's true that. it's so a natural is a natural and or organic subject I'm going to use the broad tip as long as I can get away with it kind of like a brush you know for a surrealist representing um, dreams and the hidden um, subconscious it's amazing how different Magritte's artwork feels than Dali's. Dali's sometimes feels kind of wild and chaotic in, in a way, kind of like some of our dreams do. But Magritte's art always seems so clean and, uh, and uh, organized to me in the way he um, rendered, but also in the, um, in the compositions. They were very close to symmetric, didn't use a lot of approximate symmetry. Um, he used regular patterns, so it just always seemed very organized. But you know, by contrast. So I'm not really worrying about highlights right now. I'm just trying to get uh, our initial base colors in place. But that's very true about Magritte's art, which you mentioned prior. I do feel like Magritte was definitely, you know, both. Comparing Magritte to Dali, um, both artists had uh, tremendous skill, of course. Mm -hmm. But Magritte's art kind of has a more realistic feel. It seems more plausible than Dali's art. Dali's art feels completely in the dream realm. Right. realm where um i mean he's got that one painting of a of a home or a, maybe it's a couple of houses i can't remember and it and uh it's backed by what looks like a daytime sky you know so everything that's positive space like the house the trees the street the street the the street light is all at night and then the sky is in the daytime so his juxtap juxtaposition is really what surrealism was all about, putting subject matter next to each other that doesn't really go together. And uh, he was juxtaposing, juxtaposing night and day. And I'd, I'd looked at that painting for probably a number of years, just off and on, I would you know bump into it in a textbook or run across it. And I thought, this one's always so strange because it's not surreal. And uh, and it was, I did, it wasn't it wasn't dawn on, on me that it was night and day. I thought it was just dusk, you know, the time that night and day meet, but, uh, you know, like you said, it seems very plausible, except for the except for the one with the woman on the horse. And I don't recall the title or the reigning men. Yeah, yeah. I love the woman on the horse because when we talk about ways to develop and create space in class, and we talk about overlapping, something Matt did with that stem just to make sure we can tell what's in front of and behind one another. Um, Magritte, Magritte used overlapping to great effect. 
um, to confuse a, the sense of space in that one painting. Really cool. So you're hitting some areas with two layers? Yeah, a little bit. Start to create a little um, bit of value. I'm going to try to bring a little bit of yellow in here with the chartreuse. Not sure that's going to really be too much different here on this paper since it's not marker paper. You're already getting a touch of warmth or yellow mixed in just from the paper. Yeah, for sure. There's a little bit of that in there, just a touch. And you worked well, in looks a, like my. Did, we, did you talk about working in a cross contour way with your strokes? Oh, I didn't, but I'm glad you pointed that out. I am trying to flow around the form of the apple. Um, that's going to, uh, you know, any of these marker lines that show up, uh, we might as well use them for good. Right. They should. <laughs> they should emulate what we can see happening in the in the peeling of that actual apple or of that photograph of an apple. There's no apple on the screen. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> All right, so uh, this color is dark olive green. Um, I'm just going to kind of establish a little bit of some shadow in some areas, especially up there on the top and maybe a little bit down here in the lower corner. You know, obviously we can be a little bit rough and loose with the marker applications. I'm going to try to use the colored pencils to refine things, although mm -hmm. um, this is not the big apple, but this is actually a kind of big, kind of a larger apple on my paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so considering the time constraints, I'm going to have to be a little bit mindful of that. Now I'm going to try to adjust the value a little bit with some grays. I'm going to start here with 20%, I had to 50% in my hand, 20% warm gray. And uh, that is just going to add a little bit or slightly adjust the value. It's barely noticeable, but it's, and it's dulling the color a little bit there in the shadow. I'm obviously trying to go quickly here. And we'll go ahead and use this uh, for, put down a little bit of shadow down here at the bottom. That's your 20%? That's 20% warm gray. And you can, you can't even, you can barely see it on here because mm -hmm. of the tone of the paper. And I also want to erase a little bit more of that shadow line there. We got a little bit of that graphite right there. All right, let's go a little bit darker. We'll go to 50% warm gray. See if that can make a little bit more of an impact here, which I'm sure it will. Have you worked with this combination this season, marker and colored pencil? Uh, I did actually I so. for the Janet Fish That's drawing. Right. It'll be fun to go back through these drawings in here in two weeks um, and see the variety that we got out of our our theme. So again, uh, as Ashley pointed out before, I am thinking about the cross contours. And again, I'm going really quickly uh, with these marker applications uh, because I'm trying to save as much time as I possibly can for the colored pencil applications. That's the slower part of the process. And one of the, the drawbacks to working with this paper with this medium combination is that the markers do go on a little bit darker uh, than how they eventually dry so it's you know it's you have to just trust <laughs> and hope that your choices are okay here in the beginning but it's not a big deal because we can go over the top of these applications uh, which we will in just a minute with colored pencils 
let's let's add that shadow down here at the bottom. All right, Edie has translated "This is not an apple" to French for us. Well, I'm not writing it in French. I, okay, we're going to stick with uh, stick with English tonight. Yeah, but we're going to have to stick with the language that I speak. Huh? <laughs> but I, I appreciate that. Appreciate that extra effort. Let's go ahead and uh, get a little dark value on the stem. And so a little bit of over 10 minutes there. All right, let's mm -hmm. go ahead. Got a good base down and now. switch to colored pencils. We'll come back and work, do some more work on that um, shadow. Uh, we're going to start here. Uh, let's see. This is chartreuse. So uh, I thought I recognized that our, uh, color. Yeah, our our markers don't want to show up there, but we we can let we can make this chartreuse show up here. I do have a colorless blender that I'm going to be using as mm -hmm. well. A little bit of a reflected highlight over here. Just a touch. In the shadow, got a lot of lighter green down here at the bottom, light of more of a yellow green. Yeah, that looks good. This is a pretty, pretty warm green. Green is such an unusual color, it can seem so warm or cool. Yeah, I like to think of green and purple as being transition colors, mm, swing colors. That's what I call them swing colors. I like that. They can go either way. Right, let's go a little bit lighter here. Oh, no. Let's see. I didn't get all the pencils I wanted over here. Let's go with a little cream on the edge here. We're going to make this a little bit lighter. Actually, yeah, that's kind of a secondary highlight over to be, there. Uh, actually, I want that to be a little bit cooler. I want some of these highlights to be a little bit cooler. Concentrate some of these lighter greens towards the middle, these warmer yellow greens. Dale thinks this looks like a Granny Smith apple, and I was thinking the same thing, Dale. It looks like it belongs in a pie. Hmm. There's so many apples out belongs there. Belongs in a pie. Mm-hmm. Love apple pie. You know what green I need? I need apple green. But it's not sharpened. But it is now. Buddy wonders mm -hmm. if you use markers so that you don't need as many layers with the colored pencils. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's um, and so it allows you to use some papers maybe that would take less layers. Right. Um, yeah. I, this is definitely some, some illustration trickery here mm -hmm. uh, because I can work a lot faster. Um, and it's it's given me a chance here of getting this finished. Uh, if this was all colored pencils, forget oh, about it. Yeah. It's a, otherwise, it's very slow. Yeah. So even with the marker underpainting, I still have to work really, really quickly. And this still will have somewhat of a sketchier look to it when I'm done. Or whatever state of doneness I get it to. Mm -hmm. But this paper, Stonehenge paper, is absolutely wonderful for colored pencils. And once we get past the uh, 
the initial applications with the markers, you know, um, not having much control on this paper, um, then covering it up with the colored pencils is not a big deal. Before we go too far, I'm going to take my little tiny white here. Just go ahead and get a little indication of the highlight right here. And that's just with the white pencil? This is just white, yeah. Now, do you plan to use a different medium for the brightest highlight? I do, yes. Okay. Because it's, it's brighter than, it's, uh, than your paper would allow. Right, it's almost it. white. Yeah. Um, it probably is very close to white, actually. So that's what we're going to use. We're going to use white. <laughs> um, I actually wanted this highlight to be a little bit cooler, but I'm not sure. Let's see if that's light enough and cool enough. That's I pulled certain pencils out, and I should have just brought it. I do have them next to me, but I don't want to stop and go searching for stuff. This is kind of a cool gray. All right, let's go ahead and get a little bit of a darker green here. This is, I bet it's moss green. This is moss green. I thought it was going to be dark olive green. And we're going to get some of these darker values in place and also create some of those little imperfections. It's right in the core of the shadow. Yeah. Before you hit the reflected light. And I'm trying to go, like I said, as fast as I can here and then use what time I have left, if I have any, to do any refining. Uh, any refining. Well, there's a couple questions about paper, and this is Stonehenge paper, Stonehenge, but it is a color. Uh, the color is fawn. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, I've put links in the description below to the materials that I'm using if you want to use the same material. Stonehenge paper is... Um, now one of my favorite surfaces to work on with colored pencils. It is soft, yet it has plenty of tooth for many layers of application. Speaking which, of tooth, yeah. um, Buddy was wondering if markers work on pastel matte. You've never tried that, have you? I've never tried that, and I don't foresee I, them I working like well. Would, yeah, would, would uh, possibly damage the tips. Yes, it would definitely damage the tips. Uh, that paper is extremely, uh, extremely tough, yeah. abrasive. That's a good, good word. Um, it would, it would definitely render I mean, your markers. I would say that the the word pastel is in the name, pastel matte, and it is intended pretty much just for pastels. Yeah, but you can use colored pencils on them. Oh, gosh. That's a good surface for colored pencils too. Do they blend pretty well on there? Uh, they they blend, yeah, they do actually. Oh, uh, they blend because of layering. You, I mean, you can't get away with just putting a couple layers down. You, you do have to put a, a few layers down, but they it does blend pretty well. Okay. In fact, that I have a blue jay drawing that I did for the course, Three Little Birds oh, yeah. with Colored Pencils. That's that's on pastel matte paper. And the background and was done with pastel for that the, one. The background was, it was pastel, yeah. But the bird is colored pencil. I gotcha. All right, let's go ahead and put a little bit of the indication of the highlight up here with the white. It goes right across the edge here. And 
kind of got these. So I'm kind of working from each end close to the middle of the apple. <laughs> I think it's just happening that way, but. You've got it surrounded. Got it surrounded. And uh, trust me, if, if this wasn't a timed show here, I'd be spending a lot more time on these applications. So don't, don't feel like you have to blaze through things like this. Right, you guys don't have a timer. Right, this is, this is for entertainment purposes. <laughs> um, you guys get to watch as we uh, squirm under the, the timer. All right, let's see here. Ann says she's surprised how well the white pencil shows up. And, um, you know, a lot of colored pencil sets, the white really doesn't. But these Prismacolors are soft enough that sometimes you can you can actually tell a difference with a white pencil. Yeah, and, you know, it's also dependent on the tooth of the paper, too. The more mm -hmm. tooth you have, the more the color is going to show show up in a, a more bolder it's way. pull more material off, I guess, with every stroke. Well, there's enough tooth there uh, or teeth in the paper to to grab the pigment yeah instead of just sliding right over the top of what you've already got in place yeah. all right so we'll take a colorless blender to this in just a minute just getting all the colors in place and the colorless blender will be uh, like a magic device mm -hmm. as long as i've got enough of the colored pencil material in place so I'm trying to get as much of that in place as possible. This apple is remarkably dark on one side and yeah, especially a little bit more down yellow like on the other. Down near the bottom, it does get pretty dark. When you squint your eyes at the image, you can really see that contrast. I haven't found my glasses yet, so I see contrast everywhere. That's about all I see. <laughs> you still haven't found them? I've given up. I think gonna, it's time I'm to just order some a new, new glasses. pair of glasses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's time for that. Uh, you know, I I can't see without my glasses. See, my like, my eyesight isn't so horrible that I can't make do. You know, I can still drive without glasses and those types. Excuse me, I can still draw without glasses for the most part. Um, so I've been willing to wait it out in hopes that they would somehow resurface, but I've given up. You know, I can drive without glasses, but I would probably kill myself or someone else. That's not being able to drive. Without glasses. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not legally able to drive without glasses. Oh, okay. Um, so far, I've been able to pass the sign tests whenever you know you have to renew. Yeah, uh, without the glasses, and I didn't. I didn't have to have them when I first got my license, so I'm legally allowed to drive without them. But at nighttime, I much rather have them on. I I have trouble walking without glasses, <laughs> um, so I would be in in trouble if I lost my glasses or contacts. You know, I think about. Um, being, being an artist, you know, we work we work with our hands and our eyes all the time and develop observational skills. And uh, sometimes I wonder um, about ages past before there were glasses. There, there were folks that probably never saw individual leaves on trees, you know, unless they were standing right, right next to them. Right. And I did Amen. not see that until the eighth grade. What it must have been like to go through your whole life like that. Yeah. So only certain people... You know, had the, I guess, you know, the eyesight, really, um, for certain types of jobs. Now we have the, the, the playing field has been leveled. Like sheep herding or? <laughs> like, like being an artist, for one. Oh, yeah, for me. Well, possibly being an archer or a marksman. Yeah, that's very in, true, in a right? Military unit, those types of things. Right. Uh, well, you know, I think that um, I could still be an artist. Without glasses, I would just have to draw things that are right in front of me. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Renoir's sight supposedly was pretty pretty bad um, later in his life, and uh, you can kind of tell from the softness of his painting. 
you know, a little bit of white over so, the top. So maybe it could be a contributing factor to your style. I'm sure it would be. Yeah. So next season, it's uh, Matt without contacts is our theme, and he's going to draw with no glasses. I could do that. I'm yeah. I'm looking at an iPad, and, I, and I'm nearsighted. Yeah. I mean, I can pull that off. Yeah, it's true. All right, iPad is a great little... for those of us that uh, have waning eyesight because we're able to zoom in on our references or any tablet or computer. You know, it's a real, real great advantage being able to zoom in to areas that maybe otherwise were, would be a little harder to see in a standard size photograph. I just looked at the clock and I have 17 minutes. I, I expected to look up at the clock and it say I had five minutes left. You're, you're blazing. <laughs> I can slow down now, <laughs> um, which I, I've notoriously done in the past and then run out of time. So I'm going to slow down a little bit. Uh, but yeah, that's, the colored pencil applications are going a little bit quicker than I expected. So mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Let's, uh, let's put a little bit of more of that apple green apple down there you know it's not not a perfect match to this apple in order to get that we need to continue to layer colors we'll layer as much as we want as much as we can i mean well i like the, your subtle changes of value in the shadow side of the apple no oh, thanks there it, it's it's slowly getting there mm -hmm. um still feel like it's a little too neutral over here need a little bit more color that uh, dark olive green is pretty muted we've got some little specks of yellow in there too Here and there. Anyway, this paper is soft. It's 100% cotton, but it does have a pretty good tooth on it. So, it, you know, you'll find that your your pencils will wear thin a little bit sooner than you might expect them to. Artifacts, I see your question there about Rafael. Obinsky, and I'm not familiar with his work, so I'll have to check that out. Thanks for the reference. A little bit more of the chartreuse, kind of bring a little bit more of the yellow into this apple. Can I use Mitant's paper to do this drawing? I would imagine so. Yeah, um, you're going to... The, the less... A little less toothy side. Uh, yeah, the markers are are not going to behave quite as well on the Mitant's paper. The Mitant's paper actually has more of a pronounced tooth, mm -hmm. even on the less textured side. Uh, so you're going to encounter some issues there with the marker applications. But if you're just using colored pencils, absolutely. Or you could put down maybe a little bit of pastel first and colored pencils over the top if you have enough tooth for that. Yeah, the, the materials we use are here are, are not necessarily exactly what you have to use. You can create similar drawings and paintings, mm -hmm. although we don't really do paintings here <laughs> on this uh, live show. Usually not. We use bits of paint here and there. Yeah, bits of paint. There we go. And I'll be using bits of paint in just a minute, mm -hmm. too. All right, almost ready for the colorless blender. And you've already been doing a little bit of burnishing in areas, have have you? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. it's naturally happening as I layer the colors. Yeah. Right, let's put a little bit of these. Looks like there's some little light spots here. If I can bring out just a little bit more variety. In areas. So perseverance is key. If you'll remember how the drawing started and how it's starting to change. Oh, yeah. Um, 
I'm going to work yeah, through those. Yeah, starting to feel really representational, and the stem just jumped out at me. <laughs> it's being as being completely unfinished, right, completely flat. So uh, compared to everything else, now it almost seems like it's coming off the page. Even, oddly, even though it's the the more uh, currently flatly rendered uh, uh, part of the apple. What the hell? Matt has become dangerous with this uh, marker colored pencil process. You've been using these oh, together I, for years. I love this uh, combination. Mm -hmm. It is, you can quickly, quickly get a pretty good, um, you know, representation of things in a relatively short period of time because of the, the, the work that the markers do in combination with the mm -hmm. colored pencils. You know, they kind of, they definitely complement each other. All right, um, let's see. Uh, before we, well, let's go ahead and burnish the, <laughs> let's go ahead and burnish this now. I'm gonna use a colorless blender here, and my colorless blender is becoming a nub. So I'm gonna put it in my Slide that holder. in your handy dandy pencil holder there. And then we're just gonna let some of these colors blend and mix together. And that should give us more of that that look like apple skin feel real waxy which, yeah which uh, <laughs> waxy i'm i'm applying actual wax to make it look waxy we'll refine this little area up here at the top too in just a minute. I feel like the, some of the values need to be a little bit darker up there. Although on the feet it doesn't look like they need to be. But in my real life drawing they do. And like Ashley pointed out, I've already got you know quite a bit of burnishing that it's already happening here because of just the layered applications. I need to give this a quick sharpen here. Anne's wondering if your blender is going like down into the tooth or sort of burnishing over and on top. It's uh, basically just kind of moving the pigment around so that it fills in uh, a lot of the tooth. Um, All right, we have so, another super chat, Matt, from a numbers right. girl, one of our regular supporters. Yeah. And, and, uh, what is going on with that animation? <laughs> Race quit. Uh, thanks for that, a numbers girl. We really appreciate that. That's great. And this is some kind of a race, and I'm not going to quit. <laughs> I'm not really sure how to uh, respond to that. <laughs> well, let's see here. Kind of using a combination of circular marks and then marks that flow along the cross contours of the uh, apple. And see, I got confident with my time, and now I looked up and it there's nine minutes left, and I'm like freaking out. And you feel pressured. I feel pressured. I felt pressured since the start, but but I know I got to do that stem and uh, work these areas up here, put a shadow down, and then the final touch, of course. Some, yeah, you got some. Which everyone's probably here. figured out what the final touch is. Uh, it shouldn't take very long to do that. All right. And let's see, let's make this highlight feel a little bit more natural with a gray, a cool gray, instead of the white. It's a little bit more natural looking. Uh, all right, let's see. Let's go back up here. Kind of refine this just a little bit more and then make some of the values a little bit darker inside.
I specifically chose this apple because it seemed like it had uh, the greatest variety and value compared to the other images that I found. And that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty much true to form as I'm drawing it now and really taking note of all the different values. And we're going to just put a very subtle edge out here. And that's with your dark olive. Yes. All right. Uh, now let's go in here and I'm actually going to start with indigo blue, which might seem like an odd choice, but uh, we're going to combine the blue. Super dark. We're going to combine the blue with uh, uh, dark umber to create a natural black. So um, a number of girl got back to us on the interesting GIF in her super chat. Yeah. They don't let you choose. Oh, Just, interesting. Yeah. What a what a strange one that YouTube chose <laughs> I know. for her. Race quit and then stomping on the ground. That's. It's maybe one of those lost in translation. Books. I mean, it seems appropriate for. You know, races, and I guess because you got a timer up, maybe. Surely YouTube's not that smart. Surely not. All right, now uh, let's see. Let's hit this little bit of visible stem here, where it's a little bit to the lighter value. And then we'll go ahead and go inside here. A few little marks here, too. Oh, I think it said rage quit. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. Rage quit. Rage quit. Even I told you guys bizarre. I'm not wearing glasses, so. <laughs> All right, now with the dark umber, and we can see that that combines with the dark indigo, or the indigo. And um, oh, yeah, that's a creates more of a natural looking black, which is more akin to what we see in reality instead of using black. And we can adjust, we can have uh, this be warmer or cooler. We add more brown, it's going to be warmer. If we add more blue, it's going to be cooler. So we have full control over our color temperature of our black yeah just to have that little piece stand out a little bit more we'll bring that down all right our shadow is lacking um let's see i'm gonna go back with the 20 percent i hope this is 20 percent 20 percent warm gray i think we'll give... it's two percent warm gray it's i know no kidding <laughs> um and it is not strong enough here I'm gonna have to 70% warm gray is too dark and really really this is too dark too this is the this is the 50% warm gray And what we're going to do is we're just going to let it be a pretty hard shadow underneath. And then we go with the uh, indigo, not the indigo, the dark umber. That's just right, right up against the edge there. Right up against the edge. So we can see where it meets the ground. All right. Is it time for the Posca? It, it, it may be. It's, uh, we still got, got three, three minutes. There's so many more things I can do to this. Let's go back with the white. I'll put a few specks here and there.
but he wonders if the markers will show through on the other side of the paper and I guess it's I'm not sure how what the weight of that paper is on this paper highly doubtful okay um, but I'll check when we're done. pretty heavy stuff <laughs> um, yeah I, and uh, this paper is is fairly heavy so I doubt it will be an issue but you never know it's okay right. nobody's ever gonna see the back side of the paper that's right who cares? I'm just going to take a kneaded eraser, lift up a little bit of that that errant graphite. So you have a little bit of a cleaner edge, and there is, I cannot get that edge down there to cooperate, so I'm going to. Edie's worried about the time. She doesn't understand how you're going to fit in the second artist that you're going to do. Oh, I'm not doing both artists in the the one time frame. Yeah, we're going to start with. Oh, a, no. we're going to start the timer up. We're going to do a whole nother drawing. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't know that. I hope you're not busy. Hope you're not busy tonight. Clear your calendar. The second artist is not going to take very long. <laughs> um, trust me. All right. Not particularly awesomely uh, excited about that edge, but that's okay. All right, let's, uh, let's add the final highlight here. I'm doing this with a Posca marker. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be hot. Boy, that's that's really hot, isn't it? And there is a little bit of variety in there. Right, it's not just a big, big round white circle. You know, look, it's got different, different edges to it. A regular shape. Okay, we're gonna knock that back just a little bit. Um, yeah, we're gonna knock that back after it dries for a second. And while that is drying, I need, yeah, we've gotta knock that back, that's way too hot. Um, I need my ruler. And a pencil. Here is my ruler. Yeah, I'm gonna drop right. It's got its engineering ruler out. Underneath here. Let's go about right there. I'm gonna draw a very, very thin line with my pencil. And then we are going to write this. is not and I'm trying to write it in what in a similar font that I remember right. he's not writing he's drawing letters right now. right uh, <laughs> a n n <laughs> Remember, uh, that made remember. my that made my end wobbly. It's <laughs> <laughs> not an apple. For a second, I, f I forgot how to spell apple. You know, when I'm drawing letters out, I'm notorious for misspelling them, just leaving letters out. All right, now we'll bring out the pen because now right. it's, it's serious business. It's not exactly centered, but hey, what, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, Start the timer over.
This J, that looks like a J, doesn't it? Edie says, great handwriting. It is not great handwriting, but thank you. <laughs> this is not great handwriting. You could have put that down. <laughs> this isn't really handwriting at all. It's a representation of handwriting. This is not <laughs> an apple. We'll give her a little bit more space over here. Nope. Back on back on the same schedule there. All right, we'll let that dry. There we go. And uh <laughs> That's that's terrible down there. It should be higher up, and it's not centered. <laughs> oh well. Um, let's see if this is dry. Yeah, that's dry. Okay, so we're gonna bump this down just a little bit. And um, I wonder if Renee Magritte had to had to write his statement more than once. You know, when he put it in, he was like, "Oh my gosh." Probably it's not centered, and he painted it out and had to do it again. That's the hardest. That's the hardest part of this whole thing is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, laying out writing letters. this this little stupid <laughs> sentence down here at the bottom. <laughs> oh well. So I'm I'm bumping this back with just a little bit of gray, so it's just not like it's super strong, but it's still a highlight. It's that's a little tampered down. Right, let's make it look a little bit more natural with. He says, "Das ist kein Äpfel." She's giving it to us in in German now. All right. That's great. Definitely not going to try to write that. But it seems like that would go off the paper. That's it would, less. It's, it would continue on words. forever. <laughs> All right. Is this dry? Uh, yep. All right. Uh, we'll erase our, our guidelines there. And time's up. He, this is he says and time's up like it hasn't said time's up for five minutes <laughs> i haven't looked at it uh so uh, anyway uh, it, well then it's a surprise to matt that time is up <laughs> <laughs> this is not an apple if it was an apple it'd be oblong got a little wild out well, there yeah, it's, uh, it's it's an yeah. organic form yeah yeah gotta be did a little different on both sides oh well well, there's my Magritte piece. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, All right. Now it's time to nice. reset the timer because it's time <laughs> for our <laughs> second artist. And um, to do this, I'm going to have to, Can we don't do need a photo reference. Some, right. You got to create some, some, some screen space there. So I'm how to photo reference. We'll move the timer up here. We'll move the timer up here. And I'm actually going to remove uh, the drawing here because we're done with this we're done with a well, nice the... drawing that was a, it was a oh. nice last drawing <laughs> to your season of in the style of uh, thanks I, I should have never tried to you know i should have left it just round instead of doing that oh well you don't it's, like that i don't like that no because it if you if we it if looks you like a more it, more natural apple the, yeah it does look more natural that way but it's it it's not, uh, you know, those green apples are usually more round anyway. Yeah, and you yeah. know, Magritte made them really, really round, really regular, really yeah. round. Yeah, yeah, probably more than what he was. They were at. stylized. Yeah, my apple is really not that stylized. Um, all right, so our next artist. Let's first take a look at uh, some of his artworks. So our mm -hmm. our next artist and my final artist of the season is Marcel Duchamp. And Marcel Duchamp, like Magritte, is one of the most influential artists of all time. And uh, that is crazy to even hear that coming out of my mouth, but it's very mm -hmm. true. He's lumped in the same category as Picasso and Matisse, believe it or not. I, I love his artwork. Uh, he is, was a French artist, um, and he was known for several different mo movements, including the Dada movement, which is basically whatever goes. Nonsensicalness. Right. Um, and Cubism is the piece we're looking at right yeah. now. does yeah, have a Cubist vibe cubism. here. Um, he also liked to depict a lot of movement in he his was paintings. Also, yeah, he was a futurist to yeah. some degree. Um, and... Um, he was also part of the movement for conceptual art. Um, 
Duchamp did not consider himself an artist, just like Magritte didn't. He considered himself more of a thinker, and he wanted people to think more about uh, the world around them and tried to convey that in his artworks. And I put artworks in quotations. What we're looking at right now is clearly a piece of art by Duchamp. Um, after he spent many years creating art, he actually just decided he was going to be a chess player and went off and started studying that, became quite accomplished. Um, so he's an interesting fellow, okay? So uh, this is one of his pieces that we would consider traditional. Let's look at another piece. So this is a piece that he created where he's taken a will. And um, I guess the thing that connects the will, what is that thing called? The fork. Is it a fork? For like a bicycle? Yeah. Yeah, the fork. And he has attached that to a stool. He did not make the stool. He did not make the bicycle wheel, nor did he make the fork. Um, and it doesn't, it's not like representational, like Picasso's assemblage of a, of a baboon looks like a baboon, even though it's clearly made of other parts. But this doesn't look like it's fit together to look like something else. Right. So right. It's different in that way than other assemblages. Here's another one of, piece of, one of uh, Duchamp's pieces. Somebody told me what... L-H-O-O-Q kind of sounds like in French. It's funny. I'll tell you when we're off air. Yeah, it must be something that we cannot discuss on the air. Um, this obviously is a reproduction of the Mona Lisa uh, with a little goatee on there and a little curly mustache. So this gives us some more insight into Well, that Duchamp's made people mad. I'll tell you what. <laughs> I mean, remember, he was a, a pre pretty much a master chess player. Let's make this clear, so. too. He did not paint... The Mona Lisa. No, this is just a print. This is a reproduction mm -hmm. that he's painted or drawn or somehow affixed a, <laughs> a mustache and a goatee to. And then put that little inscription there at the bottom. So that's more insight into Marcel Duchamp. Now, you might be wondering, how has how is he influencing contemporary art, conceptual art? How is, how, how is somebody like this actually getting any uh, credit? <laughs> um, well... He was challenging our um, our perception of art. What makes art art? Mm -hmm. Is it the artist that determines what is art? Is it the critic that determines what is art? Is it the public that determines what is art? What is art? Well, Can art be anything? The artist determines. What right. Is art. Absolutely. His belief was that the artist is the sole determiner of what is art, which means. Well, that's another one of his pieces. That's another Cubist piece. I wasn't. I thought the next piece was going to be the most controversial oh, one. Oh no! <laughs> but here it is. There it is. Um, yes, this. Boy, that piece is a good-looking form. Is I entitled. That it looks so good. Fountain. I this, of course, thought. is a mass-produced urinal that uh, Duchamp signed R. Mutt. At least he was decent enough to to date it. But he did use his his known he didn't use his own name, you know. Right. He just stood back and watched right. what everybody did when they saw it on a on a pedestal. Yes. Again, challenging um our idea of art and what art is and um how far he can take that. So what we are gonna do throw that out of the way. So you're gonna create a sculpture for I'm us. going to create a, oh by the way. These, these sculptures he called ready-mades mm -hmm. because they were ready-made for him. Yeah, and he would have just said, you know, they've been art all along. Nobody noticed. But right. you know what? Right. The right. designer of that urinal created it with a drawing. And the designer would have said, well, I, I did this on purpose. I, I tried to make it look good. Right. So the designer might have said, I say it's art. Functional I mean, yet beautiful. It would be nice at to the hear same a time. conversation <laughs> between him and the original <laughs> designer of this urinal. Yes. Um, we, will, we never will. I will. All right. So I am going to, that's the wrong camera, but hello everyone. <laughs> um, I am going to create my ready-made here. And uh, I'm just going to use this here. And I have already signed it. <laughs> Armut 2023. I'll bet nobody uh, even so, knows what that thing is. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a vacuum cleaner. That allows me to you know, clean up my little desk here. So 
not only is this a beautiful piece of art that I have determined as an artist to be an artifact, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is also functional and uh, here in my studio. So there you go. There's my ready-made. Yeah, Edie points out that she thinks Duchamp had an impact on the pop art movement. I would totally agree with that. You yes, know, for they sure. They were all about yeah. um, showing off what was um, popular and mass produced in popular culture as art. So uh, you could you could even maybe say he would be the father of pop art. So according to the timer, it looks like I completed that piece of art inside of a minute. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, anyway, you know, Duchamp is, is definitely uh, an influential artist, although uh, we don't always, you know, he didn't always come to mind. Uh, but he did challenge our concept of what art actually is. You um, should have signed that R Matt. Hey, that's a good idea. Yeah, I should have yeah. done that. Yeah. Artifacts points that out. <sighs> Matt and Mutt, very similar. Yeah, our, yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to be Mutt Fussell from now on. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Mutt Fussell. I love that. Um, all right. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, tonight's uh, broadcast here on Getting Sketchy. Um, and I hope it has uh, made you think a little bit more about uh, the art that you see and observe and also the art that you create uh, obviously i'm not going to encourage you to go out and create ready-mates like uh, duchamp did but i do think it's an interesting way to think about our perception of what art really is um, obviously there might have been a little bit of jest in what duchamp did uh, considering that he did not even consider himself to be an artist uh, but ended up being you know lumped in there with Matisse and Picasso. So that's it's kind pretty of good for not trying. Pretty good for not trying. <laughs> and then, of course, Magritte uh, also didn't con consider himself to be an artist, but he's also, uh, he's definitely uh, an artist that I admire. I, I And I want to make it clear that we didn't necessarily pick artists that we love or like. Uh, we did pick artists uh, for this series that were influential and, of course, would work with getting sketchy. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so I just threw Duchamp in there in, because I always like uh, to kind of challenge uh, the thoughts of my students. Um, and Duchamp is an excellent artist for doing that. Uh, Ashley, you have anything else? Uh, next week, I'll be making my final drawing in the season. And I believe I'm going to do Surratt. Uh, All things, right. Things could change between now and next week, but that's those are my plans for now. So if you're a Surratt fan like I am, and I actually happened to, he, he was influential, and I like Surratt. So hopefully, yeah. hopefully we'll have some uh, some good comments and some conversations about him next week. Yeah, and I want to be clear, I like most of the artists I chose. <laughs> There's probably one that I didn't like. Um, we won't. We won't. We won't. You'll never know which you'll one it was. Know. You can guess, but we won't tell you. You'll never know. <laughs> All right. Uh, remember, if you like this kind of stuff, make sure you subscribe to the channel and uh, give this video a thumbs up if you liked it, of course. And uh, we will see you next week for the last drawing episode of the season. And then after that, the, you don't want to miss the penultimate episode, the review show where we go through all the pieces of artwork we created this season and we critique ourselves. So uh, have a great week, everyone. And for those of you who are going to be in a live lesson, we'll see you in just a few That's minutes. Right. Good night, everybody.